All right. And we're live. Thank you very much. How are you doing, Warren? I'm marvelous, Guillaume. How are you? I'm very well. Hello, guys. Hello, everyone in the chat up there. Uh, this is Thurman's Guitars and Basses. My name is Guillaume, and I'm here today with Warren Hewitt to answer all your questions, home recording and home recording. <laughs> <laughs> home recording and home recording. And home recording, not only. Hi. Hi. Okay. I just got an idea of the the latency on the on the on the stream. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> not it's not too bad, is it? Actually? No, no, it's all right. Considering uh, we're, I mean, I mean, I'm on the west coast of America, and you're. Yeah. Oh, where are you at the moment? You're not in Bamberg. Whereabouts are you? I'm I'm close to Munich right now. Oh, okay, beautiful. Yeah, very nice indeed. Um. Yeah. So, yeah, the idea is obviously some people are uh, have. I've been stuck at home and might have had to uh, start. Oh my God! Wait, there's a. I have an issue. I like that your volume's up. <laughs> no, it was not. Okay, I think we're sorted. <laughs> um, oh. So yeah. Um, I have a I have the stream in my ears right now, but like with the ten seconds still. <laughs> is that uh, is that Phil who's organizing it? Is it Phil? Are you playing it back by him, to him by mistake? Because I'm hearing it as well. Oh, okay, okay, so it's not just me. I'm not going crazy. No, <laughs> that's good. I'm hearing to know. it as well. <laughs> All right, okay. Let's just uh, let's just walk past over that. Um, so yeah, obviously. No, it's, it's all good. Um, so a bunch of people at home and a bunch of people are trying to recall themselves and there's no one better than you to help them through the process. Uh, I have a couple questions from Instagram that I'd like to start with. And, uh, and then we can go on with the chat and all these lovely people. Um, one of my favorites on Instagram was someone asking about how do you go about doing acoustic treatment in a bedroom or room that's not meant to be a studio? Do you invest? How much of it do you do? If it's well, that's, that's that's like one of the biggest home recording questions ever, and it's where right. we started. Off to a good start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's like you know, start off with uh, what microphone should I buy, but go straight <laughs> to it. Yeah, home acoustics is the biggest, scariest question ever, isn't it? Really, because it's such a difficult question to ask because I'm not in that room. Obviously, my, my room, because um, people ask a lot, like it doesn't look like got, I've got anything going on, but I actually do. I have bass traps in the in the corners, so there are all these oh, yeah. angled bass traps in there. And then there's all of this, um, you know, first of all, it's a room within a room, so I have complete soundproofing from the outside. But I mm -hmm. have all this stuff built into the walls and into the ceiling. Um, that is not easy to do. This was a purpose-built studio, and it cost a lot of money and took a lot of time to do. In a home environment, um, there's sort of common sense moves to do, which is like, obviously, if you've got a big window on your left-hand side and a pair of speakers here or the right-hand side or behind you, cover it. Put some curtains up. I mean, it's the most straightforward thing. Glass is obviously highly reflective. It's going to take all the high end and just make your room unbearably bright. So, do logical things. Step put one, big, cover your windows. Yeah, All cover right. your windows, put some big heavy curtains up, something nice and soak up that sound. Most of it is logic. If your room is a square box or there's any kind of obvious things, which is going to be walls equal distance apart, um, ceilings, everything, all of that's going to create standing waves. There's just nothing you can do about it. You put a sand in there, it's yeah. going to keep going backwards and forwards. And if it just happens at you know, maybe 700 hertz or whatever is exactly that, distance and you might get this wah going on so the next yeah. most logical thing to do this is all not spending any real money the next most logical thing is just break up the room couch you know if it's a small room stick a couch behind you honestly makes a huge difference stick a couch yeah, up there right. other people have like bookcases on the walls yeah, and then they turn like the shelves and uh yeah, yeah. And they turn the books around the other way, so yeah. all the paper side is coming out. I mean, some of 
the biggest mixers in the world do that in their room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I've been in great mixing rooms that sound good that don't seem to have any perceptible stuff done. Now, they have done stuff, don't get me wrong, but they've done it after they've done the obvious things. So obvious things in, put a couch in there, put some chairs in there, put some soft things in there, get the hard surfaces like the walls and the, and the mirrors and, and all that stuff and cover them. Remove a mirror. Do you need a mirror in your room while you're working? Are you trying to check yourself out while you're doing that little <laughs> mix move? Hey, look at me. I'm sexy. I just... Boosted the vocal. You know what I mean? You don't it's need mirrors in there. an American psycho. Kind of yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, my God. So a, yeah. lot of it's, a lot of it's really common sense. And I yeah, think, yeah. you know, just breaking stuff up. Now, if we're talking about purchasing things, people put those pads on the walls. And you can buy them pretty inexpensively. But all yeah. they're ultimately doing is doing what we're talking about. So really, you could get a big, thick curtain if you wanted to and just hang it on, on a really hard-surfaced wall and probably do 90% of that. That's not to say that some of that stuff is not good. This good stuff is good, mm. but it's also expensive. Yeah. You know. And then yeah. the other thing is, just to move away from that, is get a really good pair of headphones as well. And like, oh, don't true. be afraid to true, work true, on, true. you're wearing a pair of really nice buyers. You know what I mean? I, I, I know many mixers that use those buyers that you've got. Those are great headphones. You know, um, I've got these blues, um, but I've also got Sennheiser. I've got some mm. buyers as well. I mean, you know, we ultrasound, you know, all these different companies and, and it I is a like lot of good stuff. Yeah. It's a lot of good stuff. I like using, I like moving between the two worlds. I tend to find I sit with the speakers you know, and then I put my headphones on and double check my mix. Yeah, um, that's really good that you. Advanced. That's really. I'm, I'm sorry for cutting you. That's really no, good no, that please. you're going there because the next question that I had uh, was again monitors and headphones, and I think like that's pretty much answered already. It's jumping back in between one another, but there's absolutely nothing wrong mixing with headphones, right? Nothing at all. And and the technology of everything that's going on with all the different softwares that's coming out is just insane. I was yeah. at Waves launch last year with Abbey Road, you know, studio system. I mean, that's just a really smart idea. Some people like that don't like it. Frankly, all the professionals I know love it. I mean, the reality is you put on a pair of headphones and it sounds like you're in a room. Yeah. You know, I love headphones and I like checking on it, but you know, you you know, working at Toman, when I was at uh, at that event at Abbey Road, they had a couple of retailers in there, and they were saying headphone sales are going up forty percent a year, and that last year they had doubled. Because the reality is, is like exactly what that first question is pointing to: who the heck has got like ten thousand dollars to design a perfectly designed room? Yeah, yeah. And, and and also mobile. You know, you take your laptop with you and work in all of these different environments. You know, exactly. it's. You know, I mean, Andrew Sheps talked about it with, he uses just those cheap Sonys, those 7506s, which I think sometimes sell for like, you probably sell them for like a hundred bucks, a hundred euros. Yeah. They're so cheap. Um, and they, they're just an industry standard. They've been making them for like 30 years. The buyer um, DT100s, you know, mm. the white ones, they've yeah, been making yeah, yeah. those since the 70s. That's they're, hor they're great sounding, horrible sounding headphones all at the same time. They're all pure mid range, but I know so many people that know them really, really well. Exactly. Yeah. That's the thing, right? It's not really about how good they are. It's how well you know them and how well you know, okay, exactly. this is like, this is the biggest difference. Yep. Yep. Agreed. Yeah. That's really cool. That's really cool. That makes me feel better because I've been mixing with headphones for the past week and a half. And uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's been great. It's been really good. Um, okay. Um, had a bunch of comparison <coughs> questions as well. Uh, let's go over them real quick. Someone was asking first interface, Focusrite or Steinberg, any preference? Um, we have both. Well, to be honest, we like this. We like the Steinberg. Um, I mean, I have a, I'm blessed because I get, I've got a lot of stuff. I mean, I've got Apogee, Avid, Audient. Um, I've got some old Focusrite stuff, but mm. we've got um, the Steinberg. We've we've been uh, using. Hey, look, when did we get it, Eric? Maybe a year ago. And what we love about Steinberg stuff is it sounds great. They all sound great. Audience yeah, sound yeah. great. They all sound great. But what we like about the Steinberg, which I think beats some other companies is the amount of connectability because when we're going around and doing mobile stuff and we're going mm. to other people's studios and doing courses with them and we need to be able to turn up to a studio and have an optical input an aes input uh yeah, yeah you know yeah, yeah. and there's something typical about and you know this uh, with with german design stuff is they tend to overly engineer yeah so they tend to give you <laughs> 
50 options when you might only ever need one, but that yeah. one time every six months, well, if you need, you need it, call and it's got like, it. Okay, it's here. It's got yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I, I, I like that. And that's always been the approach of uh, a lot of German equipment. And, and, and the Steinberg has definitely got that. It, it, so for us, it's been a lifesaver because we'll turn up at a studio you know, going, Hey, give us, uh, give us, uh, you know, a pair of XLR outputs. And they're like, Oh, I don't have any more, um, analog outputs, but I've got this digital or this digital or this digital. Yeah. And we just open up, you know, there it is on the back of the Steinberg, the AES CBU, the optical, the ADAT, the blah, 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 everything. Yeah. That's awesome. So that's my, that's, that's my preference there. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, the second one was KRK versus Yamaha monitor monitors. I suppose you need to. I, I've always, I, I haven't had, I've done one direct or two direct comparisons um, between those monitors. Um, I think the Yamaha range in that sort of HS series is yeah. really, really great. Um, I know that a couple of my friends, Auric Wild, who's a um, Swiss, and he, he mixes on, uh, on KRK, excuse me, on the cheaper ones and has been mixing on them for forever. And I think, I'd be amiss if I was to say one was better than the other. I think, to mm. be quite frank, it goes back to the point you just made about five minutes ago. Is like, yeah. if you've grown up on, a, if you've got a pair of Karaoke's, for instance, or you've got a pair of Yamahas, and somebody is saying, "Oh, I prefer this or this," well, then they probably prefer it because they use it and they know it. Yeah. And it's quite silly to sort of say that one seven hundred dollar each, or you know, a thousand dollar monitor in that price range. You know, the, the differences are going to be fairly negligible. I only think there's a couple of products that I would say are, are, are maybe you know twenty percent better for their price. Yeah. Um, but I think in that kind of price range, I, you know, if you're already a KLK K user, don't just sell something at six hundred to buy something else at six hundred. Yeah. Just yeah. wait, save your money come back six months time and just buy something uh, which is a massive upgrade you, you know yeah, what i'm definitely. saying yeah, yeah no absolutely i get you um uh, yeah again mostly what you're used to that was that's funny we we're writing an article that's coming out next week on billy eilish and her recording and uh, it turns out for her first album uh they just use like an at 2020 uh going into sure. um apollo and into yamaha hs5 yeah all of that's great i mean that's for that's four Grammys. <laughs> yeah, I mean Audio Technica. Um, I've long been a fan of Audio Technica. Um, there's there's certain companies that I really can kind of get behind that make product mm. ranges from the cheapest mics up to the most expensive. And all the yeah. Audio Technica ranges is definitely one of those. In fact, talking of headphones, while we were talking about headphones, we should have said Audio Technica. I think Audio Technica probably have some of the best entry level headphones. Oh, I'm yeah. sure they're in your top ten selling. Oh headphones. yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. You know, when most I, I had a good conversation with Barry Rudolph about this a couple of years ago because I got bombarded with questions about headphones, you know, as mm. it started to explode headphone sales. And a lot yeah. of people were asking me, what is the best entry level? And, you know, he's reviewed a hundred different headphones. Mm. And he said, on average, Audio Technica always come out best in that low price range, you know. Yeah. Yeah. They're, it's they're really a great good value. Yeah, absolutely. Really good value headphones. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, I use KRK. The chat seems pretty happy. Sorry, guys. I haven't been giving you so much love. I've been focused on, well, the conversation mostly. <laughs> um, all right. I'm going to start fishing for question. I have one uh, for Victor in the meantime, who also owns a studio. He's a really, really good dude. And he's wondering about your choice of mic for an acoustic guitar, the placement of said mic, and the signal chain behind this. Um, for what, sorry? For recording what, sorry? Acoustic guitar. Oh, sorry. acoustic guitar. I'm sorry. That was a long question. <laughs> I, I, I actually, no, no, it was a long question. And I was also answering a question here. Audio Test Kitchen are on here. Hi, Audio. Hi, Alex. Um, <laughs> there's lots of lots of our friends here. It's fantastic. The, yeah. yeah, for acoustic, um, again, small diaphragm microphones have always been my favorite. Mm -hmm. When I'm doing like rock and indie stuff if i'm doing something super super pop i'll go for a large diaphragm and i'll pull it back like for instance let's hold up this for a second yeah hopefully you can see this okay i like obviously this is a acoustasonics but imagine it's a bigger body acoustic guitar i like to mic down here with a small diaphragm if you can see that yeah pointing away from the sound hole and that honestly i get amazing results with cheap i'm not joking with cheap um 
small diaphragms. I used, um, I've used 4041s, which aren't that cheap, but they're like three, 400 ish. And I've used the entry level Lewitts. Like what are, you know, what are they, you know, like they're a hundred, 150 euros. Yeah. The point is, is like you could go for most manufacturers, Sennheiser, their entry level small diaphragm is pretty darn amazing for acoustic guitars. Now you might ask me, why is that? Because what I want when I'm EQing an acoustic guitar is to get rid of the low end woofiness from the mm. sound hole, and I want to brighten it slightly. And you know what? Cheap small diaphragm microphones do. So, yeah, yeah, they don't pick up much low end, yeah. and they tend to be a little brighter. It's quite miraculous that some of the best um, acoustic guitar recording I've ever done and people have remarked on has either been with a cheap 150, 200 ish um, small diaphragm or get this the best compliment i ever got from mark ender one of the greatest mixers who ever lived called me up and said what did you use on the acoustic it sounds amazing and i was like oh i did it at home on my le system this is in like 2000 on my with my um you know dg001 and all i had was a 57 and he <laughs> and he and he goes he wasn't surprised he goes oh that explains it okay. and i was like what do you mean he goes oh yeah i always get the best results with a 57 so it's like if you just want like a rock kind of indie guitar sound, the cheaper mics and actually dynamics can sound really, really good in that mm. position. Now, if you want beautiful, big, open, pop, you know, shimmery, um, yeah. you know, acoustics, then what you need to do really is go to about the 12th and 14th fret here. So this kind of area here and pull back maybe, you know, what is that like uh 50 centimeters you know whatever that is in inches as well yeah um you know and and pull back with a large diaphragm preferably this is where you preferably spend a little bit more money because what you're doing is you're taking it a long way from the sound hole but you want to reproduce low end so you want the warmth so that will give you a super poppy sound but that's where you probably want to spend a little bit more money and go for something pretty tasty in the large diaphragm area yeah right. Okay, okay, that makes sense because I, I did a couple of trials with like uh, large diaphragm uh, mics for acoustic guitar, and I never really managed to have what I was looking for. And I think that's why, that's what you explained. Like I wasn't looking for that massive roomy sound, but more of a you know, bright, uh, snappy yeah. present in a mix kind of a thing. So that's pretty well, we've, cool. We've learned over the years. I mean, where's my D nineteen? I mean, you know, one of the most famous mics of all time. Is this Austrian D19. Hasn't been made in decades, but it's just an illustration because the reason why this is so famous is because it was used on all the Beatles recordings. Yeah. But when it was new, it was AKG's version of that didn't exist at the time, but mm. basically a multi-purpose dynamic microphone. It was AKG's 57, if you like. 57, yeah. Even though a 57 didn't come out to the late 60s, mm. at least the prototypes. But the point is, is like this was a relatively inexpensive di dynamic microphone. So I like the message. You know, this is what Jeff Emmerich used. And when, when I asked him why he used this, he said it's basically just because it was on a stand, ready to go. And guys yeah. like John Lennon, et cetera, didn't have the patience they had the idea and they wanted to put it down so it was on a stand and he just went rip, <laughs> pulled it down on the acoustic rip, a vocal rip, you know electric guitar rip, and everything was in the chain ready to go and you know it's, it's something that auric wild always talks about um you know the best microphone that you've got is the one that's closest to you yeah i, I get that um okay um those all right now i had a personal question i just wanted to step away from the gear just for a minute please so all right i've been i've been recording my own songs and i've been so playing the songs record like doing the home recording things and i'm an easily distracted kind of guy so oh, you. <laughs> I, I suppose i hope so because <laughs> otherwise that makes my condition really bad uh but <laughs> no, yeah so and the thing is, so I would start tracking, right? I would lay like two, two, four guitars, whatever. Stop back, listen to it. And then while listening, I, I tell myself, okay, that sounds good, but that would sound better if it were panned, if it was EQ'd. And then I start going into that. I start panning, start EQing. And then four hours are gone and I haven't recorded anything else but these four guitar tracks. So like my workflow is a bit... Uh, 
you know, I'm I'm jumping from one hat to the next, and it's in the end, it's just not working. I can't end up with a full song. Do you have a particular workflow uh, in your studio? And, yeah, absolutely. A couple yeah. questions for you though. Yeah. Uh, what kind of amps are you using? Are you using real amps or virtual? Uh, v- virtual. So this makes me think about something because uh, um, so I was talking to Glenn Fricker last night, and mm. he's doing a um, like a competition. Um, not a competition. That's not true. A, a um, what do you call it? A, a, a collaboration with a bunch of different YouTubers, and some of the smaller ones he's going to bring up and elevate some smaller YouTubers, some great guitar channels, and they've been sending in tracks. And he said one of them was absolutely amazing, and the guy was, I don't know, a teenager, and he said yeah. it sounded phenomenal. And he's like, "Wow, I can't believe he's mixing." And I listened to it, and I said, "Do you know why it sounds so good?" And he's like, "No." I said, "It sounds so good because he didn't mix it." Yeah. What he did is he just plugged in, he got a good sound in an amp simulator, which some boffin has probably spent six months designing to sound yeah. like the best recorded Marshall you've ever heard in your life and just recorded it. And then he went to some other boffins, incredible drum, you know, software where they spent days recording drum samples, EQing and compressing and making them sound amazing and just use that. Yeah. And that was the secret. The, the, the kid that did it, he was a teenager didn't screw with it and one of the problems for us is we tend to overthink um so if i'm using virtual stuff i tend to find a sound i like and then use that and move quickly there's it's because you know the person designed it and and modeling it has spent weeks months sometimes Mm -hmm. years getting the best sound it doesn't mean that you shouldn't eq and compress and whatever but save that for later yeah you know because they've probably done so much of the work for you i mean it's like when you buy like virtual instrument pack you get like a virtual pianos now it's insane i mean it's like i joke about it all the time you can get a bextein you know uh um recorded in uh, the vienna you know whatever opera house yeah and it's like recorded by world-class engineers with the best microphones and the best mic pre's and they they record it a hundred times to get every velocity and then you play it on your usb keyboard and it's like you're literally got all of those hundreds of hours of of, of acquired knowledge just Don't every note you it. play yeah, yeah. It's like help yourself out. Use use these sounds and 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 they'll pull up. They're going to sound ninety nine percent of the way there, and yeah. just get creative, and then save that mixing and decision making for later. You know. But for me, you were asking specifically about my workflow. Well, what we've done here is we pretty much leave everything mic'd up, and then of course we do change things. But with, with, there's always a guitar amp plugged in, so I can just plug into a Marshall and start strumming, and the mic pre's already got. And if I want to change the sound, great. But mm. if I'm just trying to put the idea down. It's off I go. I've got something, you know, good I can use immediately. Right. Okay. I'll try that tomorrow. Uh, now, someone, uh, I think Paul or Lucas, Paul Lucas, both actually, uh, had a good uh, good comment there. In that um, write a song first, then do production. Trying to do production and writing at the same time is difficult. But yep. Isn't it like sometimes when you end up being re- like you recording something and you had something and you thought that yep. was it, that was the song, and then you record it and you stumble upon something completely different, and then you basically improvise for the rest of that that session. Like sometimes yeah. it's, it's, that that can be pretty incredible as well. Yeah, exactly. You just it's uh, it, that's the difference between as you're pointing out between writing and creating mm. and just recording if you're just recording then you definitely you know you you can spend time because you already know what part you're going to play especially if it's things like you know you've laid down a song and you need to beef it up so you're going to put some rakes in the chorus you know you want all your downbeat chords to be you know just playing like you know or you're just doing some high line Those are all like, yeah, spend some time, get some sounds together, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. have some fun. But when you're in the creative zone, you're right. And Paul's right. Wherever you end up is where you end up. And I've started with like a very straight, a straightforward idea and ended up with something prog rock. And I've started off with something prog rock and ended up with a two chord song. Yeah. You just never know where it's going to go. You know, that's the beauty of it, right? Yeah, exactly. 
Uh, all right. Uh, the f- I think the first question I got off of Instagram earlier was a good one as well. Uh, where do you start with home studio? I think that's very vague. That can imply a lot of things. Let's phrase it and say, if you had to spend your money on one thing, what would it be? Would it be your interface? Would it be a mic? Would it be? Um, it depends on what you've got. But uh, yeah, I think I think a nice, basically you want to start with the point of source. If the instrument mm. sounds good, it's in tune, it's being played well, those are all the first things. Performance has got to be great. So you've got a I great performance. That. Yeah. So start with that. Now stick the best microphone that you can get for the job. And sometimes it's a $79 microphone. And sometimes it's, you know, the sky's the limit. Um, put the microphone in front of it. So if you're going to, and then just keep going down that chain, because if, if the performance and the, the part and, and, and the instrument sounds like all of that's garbage, doesn't matter what you put, you can put a $15,000, you know, vintage Neumann in front of the world's worst performance. It will still be the world's worst performance. <laughs> um, so you're much better off with a 57 or a, an a equivalent hundred euro mic, you know, you're better off with that yeah, um, yeah, yeah. in front of an amazing performance you know what I mean? Then nothing. It's whatever you've got, but definitely best microphone you can, you, you can afford for the situation, you know, it's, de- it's, decent cables. Yeah, yeah. Decent cables. Um, not that there's a huge amount of difference in cables, but it, it, it can play a, it can definitely play, um, um, into it. If you're running very, very long cables, um, yeah. you can, you can hear issues and, and obviously badly shielded cables, but again, you know, Mike, um, interface these days, it's pretty crazy. I mean, you probably know this cause you guys have get to access every piece of equipment interfaces these days are insane. It's yeah. like the cheapest interfaces sound so much better than the, the most expensive ones did 20 years ago. Yeah. It's like, and, and I've been told by every manufacturer that they all use the same chip. So it's all of the architecture around. So if they've all mm. got the same chip, whether it's a hundred hundred euro interface or a hundred dollar interface or a ten thousand, it's really about everything they're putting around it. So yeah. you know you can, and you know I was talking to uh, um, uh, Matt McGlynn from Recording Hacks, and he was saying honestly, just if you're not distorting or clipping and you print at a decent level in most interfaces, he goes the difference is imperceptible. Yeah. So just print a decent level, not too hot, no clipping. Mm. Keep it in like that 65% range maximum. So you're not even going to even hit any kind of clipping or yeah. distortion whatsoever. And you'll be amazed at the quality you can get. That's, that's a really, really good and elaborate answer. Thank you very much. You're very um, welcome. Okay. What else did we have? Um, okay, I did get a bunch of different questions kind of relating, like just gravitating around the same thing. A bunch of people asking digital or actual tube amp, but of people being like, we're at home, uh, tube amp is not an option. Uh, some of those are like, I have a hundred watts and I'm running, uh, two notes or I'm running, um, the ox or I'm running this or that. Any, uh, do you have any experience with, I, I suppose you do, but experience with these load boxes and the kind of results uh, you can get out of these? Which one are you talking about? Are you talking about the ox with the, with the, with, yeah, let's, with the speaker emulation or are you just talking about load boxes to go on the back of amps? Yeah, let, let's keep it general on, on load boxes in general because I guess yeah. there's, I have, there's many I options used, now. Yeah, I got to use the ox, uh, you know, last year with you guys when, I, when we did TGU. TGU. Yeah, yeah. And the, the results were amazing. Um, I forgot that I was not using, you know, that, that I wasn't using the cab. Yeah. It was pretty amazing. Uh, yeah, that, so the, the Ox is, is, is insane. Um, and I like IRs in particular. You know, I have a strong association with Lancaster, the impulse responses from that. Mm-hmm. I, like, I like using impulse responses. Yeah. Um, and they can be great. I was having a conversation yesterday about that with recording keyboards, for instance. People were saying, how can I get depth in my mixes? I was talking to the student in the Netherlands, and they were trying to understand how to create depth. And I said, well, if you're working with exclusively or v- mostly with virtual instruments, the problem is that you don't have that depth. So use impulse responses. Put a speaker in the way. Make it feel like, 
it's not everything forward. Otherwise, yeah, you're mixing yeah, yeah. EDM and everything is as loud as each other. And before you know it, the track has no depth. So, you know, impulse responses, I'm a big fan of. So secondly, you know, talking specifically about low boxes, I've used every single one. Most amps, or not all amps, but most modern amps now have them on the back. Yeah. They build them in. I know there's a probably a little bit more expensive, but, you know, when you think of, you know, half of the amps that we saw, you know, at, at uh, CGU last year had that facility as well, where they have yeah. that, you know, what I used to call as a kid a power soak. I know they're yeah. load boxes. Yeah, and yeah. And that's, yeah. that's amazing. I mean, you can literally plug into this huge 100-watt amp and have it play 2 watts yeah. or 5 watts and have a bedroom volume amp and... It's amazing because it's crashing all the way through, and then at the very end, it's turning it down. And so you still get that incredible sound yeah. of the amp just on its edge of frying alive, and it's amazing. Yeah, yeah it's, so loads. it's so satisfying. Yeah, but that's yeah. why I hesitated earlier when you asked me uh, if I record it with an actual amp or like because I'm using the Rev D20, so I always feel bad saying no. I'm. It's not a like it is an amp. It is youtube amp but it, it is going through irs and i'm recording through irs and so like kind of in between i was on the fence i didn't know what to answer that so what's so funny is like i'm racking my brain thinking which amp should i talk about and i was thinking oh i'm going to talk about rev because i yeah. love rev and yeah. then i thought to myself oh wait there did i did they have rev there i couldn't remember and, and of course of course <laughs> yeah. they had rev there we did a whole video together yeah no the rev stuff is amazing great guys really oh, yeah. And, you know, half of this stuff just and I'm sure you understand half of the stuff we're talking about is like there's a lot of companies that make really, really amazing products. There's so many incredible companies. I just tend to find that the ones I the ones that like reach out, care about people, you know, which is obviously Derek over at Rev. And, that, yeah, that, yeah, you know, yeah. we all we all love him because he gives a schnizzle. You know, what I mean, he really cares. Absolutely. And, and that actually texted me he texted me last week because he wanted news from europe and make sure that everyone was okay like that was yep. that was, that's the kind of guy he is it's yep. just incredible so it's it's interesting because that when people ask us about products that's part of my thinking i'm thinking to myself well there's these there's these three or four companies i like and i uh, and and why do i like them products are really good people are exceptional and the support is really good. If the yeah. support is really good, then I can get behind it. Because if you and I are talking about products we love, it's great if you can afford to buy anything and 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 you can get a concierge service. You know, you buy your you but you know somebody buys themselves a Ferrari. I can't, yeah. but you know, and but they take it to the mechanic and and they get given a gift Ferrari to use for the day. That's great. But what about the what about the rest of us that can't do that and we buy yeah. something at 500 euros or whatever it might be i want to know that you're getting that kind of quality service and that's the reason why you're probably fine with me i talk about certain companies more than others because in my experience they look after the customers so I, and I that's really that. important yeah. yeah i understand yeah. that uh okay i've been like there was that one moment in the chat where everyone was kind of going crazy about the same thing so i have to ask that question what's the question, what's the question? Uh, I, I think it was uh i can't remember the words exactly but basically we're saying is usb 2 still relevant when you compare it to usb uh, 3 or thunderbolt regarding interfaces uh, how's the latency how has that evolved can you still use regular usb interfaces and have a good result well i think look the the bottom line is um you know, 90% of the world is not on the latest and greatest. It's been one of those conversations ever since like Windows 95 came out. Let's, you know, yeah. all, all joking aside, one of the realities is, is like designers are always going to design for the fastest and the greatest and the best. That's just the mm. way it is. But the rest of the world, we don't all go out and sell our brand new computer the day that Thunderbolt came out or the day that USB uh, 3 came out or whatever yeah. it is. That's just so, so 99, probably 95% of the world is on one, possibly two generations back. That's just the reality. Yeah. Um, obviously, interfaces um, have a, a simple function where you can mix between the direct signal and the signal that you're hearing off of your DAW. That's a simple thing that most inexpensive interfaces do, knowing that however you set your computer, you're going to have, you're going to have some latency. So yeah. does it mean that Thunderbolt and the latest USB is, is, is almost, you know, imperceptible? Yeah, it is almost imperceptible, but it's still only almost, it's not entirely. Um, but 
it hasn't stopped people for the last 20 years making great records. So absolutely. I think that's really the answer is like, yeah, get the latest and greatest if your budget allows, but probably like me and everybody else, you'll probably slowly change over yeah, and just, buy new equipment. We don't all just go, Oh, okay, this is new. I'm going to sell that. You know, it's just not what we do and it's okay. Don't feel shamed because the kid down the block whose parents like, have more money than they know what to do with just bought him the latest and greatest who yeah. cares it doesn't mean that he or she is a better musician than you. you you know what i mean it's people don't buy music because oh wait there i'm, I'm driving in my car and a song comes on the radio i can tell that this was recorded using thunderbolt i much yeah. prefer <laughs> man i really love how whatever the question is and how like gear related it can be you bring it to the human and you bring him back to the performer i really really appreciate that well, thank you. I appreciate it. Th great questions. Thanks, um, everybody, for uh um, Yeah, for we have some really good people in there. Um, okay, I read the word quantize in the chat. Um, do you want to go there? Do you not? Yeah. Do, you, do you quantize? And do you it's think genre it's genre dependent? Okay, so it's not a bad or a good thing. It's a tool. What yeah, what, what are you doing? I mean, what genre are you doing? Um, you know, when I listen to, like, so much modern metal, and it's just... Yeah. Says, you know this yeah. kind of stuff yeah, yeah, and yeah. and you know these days most of those modern metal bands um you know the guitar players are using virtual amps so mm -hmm. what does that mean it means that they're playing recording a di and then editing their di perfect yeah you know and then they're sitting there i've you know they're tuning it as well they're tuning their guitars so they get that band and it's oh, wee, woo, woo, woo. you know it's all yeah. absolutely perfect yeah. i watch youtube videos of guys playing and you and i know they just went to that bend and they moved their finger up you know because they missed the bend but the note went <laughs> straight there perfectly you yeah. know and, and, uh, i had a great conversation with ola um at uh you know ola england at um at uh, uh, nam this year and he said that he doesn't do any of that and you can tell you watch his videos and oh, his yeah. playing is absolutely superb but then he said he had some some guy going oh you're not as good as this other guy and yeah. then he went to the other guy's video and the other guy's <laughs> just like every single thing is like yeah, the fingers I'm, I'm are moving and cuz i'm actually playing it <laughs> and you're not and it's going through this amp behind me and it's it's so it's that same philosophy what are you going for you know um when it comes to guitar playing people are editing their di's tuning their parts you know coming across you know is this in, insane then you know there's so you've got all of that when you watch you know these kind of things and you've got the same thing with drums you know modern metal guys the drummer is programming the drums yeah so he might be playing it live but in the studio he's programming it and so many of this this stuff is you know, and then, you know, I was on uh, one of those uh, podcasts the other day and they were all talking about what what exact kick and snare sample they use in metal. Mm. And it's like, you know, all the all these people were saying they use the same kicks and snares. There's nothing wrong with that. So if you're doing metal, you do what you do. You want to do it. You want it to be super type. You want to program it, especially if you're doing like super proggy over the insane stuff. Yeah, but yeah. if you're doing jazz... <laughs> then you throw up Might like three mics on the so drum well. kit yeah. yeah and you let you let the drummer just kind of express themselves and you let the dynamics breathe so that sort of idea that there's only one way to do it is just absolute bs because if somebody came to me to do a modern metal record modern metal record i'm going to listen to every modern met rec modern metal record that's good yeah. and do it the way that they do it and, and hopefully make it even better still i'm yeah. not you need multiple skill sets. If you want to have a career in music, you've got to be able to do it all. And the thing is, the technology is available now for you to do that. It's not 30 years ago where, you know, you used to have to understand how to use a tape machine and a console. And, yeah. and, and it was like, you know, a couple of years just to get to that. Now you basically open up your DAW. You've got the best mixer you've ever seen in your life. When I started as a kid, I go to the best studios in the world. They'd have five multi effects. Yeah. Five multi effects. They'd have a really nice digital delay, maybe a tape delay, uh, a lexicon, maybe a plate, and maybe like a Yamaha SBX90, and maybe one or two others. And my con and the console you were mixing on had five, maximum eight auxiliaries. So if you're lucky, you had eight sets of effects on your whole mix. Now you open up your DAW, you can put a reverb like and a delay on every 5, single. 5,000. <laughs> Yeah, so that's, everything, that's everything's there. 
Yeah, we just have to remember it's all available to us. So, yeah. you know, so when when I go to these, you know, these things and I watch videos, people talking about like, oh, you know, they quantized or or the opposite, you know, telling people off because it doesn't really matter. It's like, what genre are you doing? There is no one way to do anything. If I wanted to do a Led Zeppelin style track with three mics, you know, early Led Zeppelin, that's great. I'll do it. But I yeah. can't pull a wa- uh, put a wall of Metallica guitars and expect to hear the drums through three mics. It's just yeah. not going to happen. Now, people are going to debate me, but they can't actually physically prove it. They're like, oh, yeah, John Bonham. It's like, yeah, John Bonham. If, he, if, if, if Jimmy Page wanted to make a record with John Bonham now with six sets of four by 12s on each side, <laughs> he be. would be doing everything he could to make sure that kick and snare came through. Yeah. So, you know, there's different mixing techniques. There's different things that we do now. And it's all, again, genre dependent. When I listen to Led yeah. Zeppelin, one of my favorite bands, I hear two acoustic guitars or one acoustic guitar, bass, and drums, or I hear one guitar possibly doubled going down, 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 yeah. playing single strings. I don't hear, oh, yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah, sure. So we have to remember there's no one way to do it. Yeah. That drumming technique for an amazing drummer like John Bonham works in that genre. But if you're doing modern metal, you've got to think differently. And if you're doing jazz, you've got to think differently to that. Learn it all. You've got the tools, you've got your DAW, get in there, you've got virtual instruments, just learn everything you can. And then when your clients walk in through the door, um, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. You can do that and, and, and make an eclectic record. Make a record where it's like freaking huge guitars on one and yeah. then acoustic guitar, two mics on a drum kit on the second song. As long, How, as, long as you're serving the song and you're serving the record. Yeah. There you go. You but, just summed up my whole conversation. No, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. That was, that no, was no, really no, it's good. good. Serving the song. Yeah. That made, yeah. That, made me, that made me think of like what you were saying about the amount of effects that we have available nowadays. And I kind of felt like everyone going Google Maps and instead of going to see everything they haven't seen, they go check out their house on Google Maps. And like to me, that's something that applies a lot to effects within, uh, you know, doors and plugins and multi effects, like kind of that option paralysis that is here. And you tend to, you, you're going to tend to stick to the one template, regardless of the style of music that you're in. Um, you have a bunch of amps, you have a bunch of effects and preamps and processors and everything just like literally right behind you uh do you still have that kind of option paralysis or with time does that go away um no i I, yeah it it has sort of gone away um i don't have the paralysis i definitely get optionitis um Mm. to a certain extent but not really i mean one of the things is is like you're sort of implying which i agree with is like the more you do it the quicker you can get from a to b because most of the time the option paralysis is really just the fact that you hear a great sound in your head and you can't figure out what it is i think that's that's going to go away for all of all of us it's like the more you do it you go you put on a record and you go i want that guitar sound and you think that you've got it but you really haven't and even if you do get that sound, it's understanding that what you you didn't really want the guitar sound, but you wanted the you wanted the sound of the guitar in the mix. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, what I yeah mean absolutely. Is, yeah, so I might go in and go, oh, I want Jimmy Page's guitar sound. So I get Jimmy Page's guitar sound, and I realized I didn't really want Jimmy Page's guitar sound. I wanted the way <laughs> his, his guitar sounded, sounded inside in the song, of yeah. the song. So I'm like, oh, I want that fuzz tone guitar but it doesn't work in my song. Yeah. Uh, it might work if I mute, 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 mm. the 400 overdubs I've done. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, now it's that Jimmy Page guitar sound that yeah, I want. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, that's the thing. It's, um, it, there, there's a little bit more to it. It's a little bit like, you know, the joke um, where, where somebody comes in. I, I've had so many mixers tell me this exact thing, and it, it mirrors the Metallica Led Zeppelin conversation. Mm. Every major mixer I've ever spoken to makes this kind of joke about how they've got a band behind them and the drummer comes in and plays when the levee breaks and says, this is the drum sound I want, but bigger and with more rooms, you know, and then the guitar player comes in and plays like a Metallica song, which is literally just a wall of guitars and a drum sound, which, you know, it's just all high, high end and low end on the kick. Yeah, so that yeah. it can cut through the guitars. So it's like, and the kicks, 
And so the guitar player wants that sound, the drummer wants that sound, and then the singer comes in and wants the vocal sound, <laughs> which, is a, which is this huge vocal sound over a piano. And so they want, all three of them want that sound in the same song. Yeah. And the mix is like, okay. <laughs> so you want big, open, not much in the mix, drums, <laughs> but you want all of guitars with nothing in the mix except for clicky drums, and you want a vocal sound which is bigger than both the speakers with nothing else except for a piano. And how are we going to do that? And, you know, and that's, that's always the challenge, you know, is, is trying to make that all happen. Yeah. And that's where we have to learn all of these techniques. And, you know, the solutions to those quite often – you know, is it, it's the solutions to those kind of things is find where there's a drum break, push up the rooms, make mm. the drummer feel satisfied. So when the guitars come in, it soaks up all those rooms, but he hears that sound where it's supposed to be. And the same thing with the vocal, you know, allow that big openness, strip down guitars in the verses so that there's, open. it's, so what happens is like the optionitis thing that we're talking about really comes to acquired knowledge where you realize that you're not going to achieve all of these things. You're trying to get things that you realize you can't actually do. So you have to find tricks to do them. And I think that that's what optionitis really was for me. It was just me learning what works. I yeah. thought that, Oh, you know, I'm trying out these 55 different guitar sounds. Well now I might have three mental choices of what guitar sounds or parts work mm -hmm. because I've realized those other 52 were just me, that learning process to realize that all of those other things don't actually work in that circumstance. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. That was really, really good. How much um, do I owe you? You take it's your super chat, but I'm going to give him money. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Um, uh, I don't even know if we can. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, I feel like my connection has been laggy a little bit and um, the, I don't have all the comments, so at least not the last ones. Maybe we can, uh, we can go into one last question and talk about what do we have here? 57 people go on about the sm57 that's crazy it's it's a great utility mic it's but, a great mic uh but at the same time honestly you know any affordable dynamic microphone that you already own or is in the price range that you can afford is going to give you yeah. a job if you go on a time and site now and see whatever their best-selling dynamic inexpensive mic is and it's it's 50 euros cheaper than say than the 57 for you and that's all you can afford just buy it Get yeah. started making music. When we're talking about interfaces here, I like Audion. Everybody knows I do because I like the company and they're really supportive. But if you if they if there's a product there that starts at you know whatever it is and you need something that's cheaper, just buy the one that you can afford. Get going. I love the Steinberg stuff because the connectability. Do you need the connectability or not? The point is, is like it's more important to buy what you can afford and start making music yeah. than it yeah, is yeah. to. Don't get paralyzed. We talk about yes. being paralyzed of option. Don't get paralyzed of not recording because the gear that you want in your mind is unaffordable. Just yeah. get a, buy the gear you can afford. I'd much rather see somebody with a 300 euro, 300 dollar, you know, setup making music than somebody that's just just singing in memos into their cell phone waiting so they can afford 2000 euros worth of gear. Yeah. That's just not the way to go. No. You know, just, uh, the just end game going. is to, yeah exactly the end game is to make music it's not just to accumulate preamp for the sake of accumulating preamps so yeah, yeah whatever, think, whatever I, you got and i think in this world here where everybody's sitting at home in 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 uh, in, in these environments i, I think that th most companies that are going to see sales on products are going to be in that entry level because it's this is about now like motivating people to to suddenly realize they've got time on their hands yeah. You've got time on your hands. It's like if you don't have any gear yet or you've got very limited stuff, just just get the things that, you know, don't stop yourself. Don't get paralyzed thinking, well, I can't afford that really famous $10,000 microphone, I so I'm not going to buy one. Yeah. So don't do that. Just just buy the $300 pushes, microphone. It's so such a creativity boost as well like yep. if you can't afford that effect or that thing or that thing it's then like you end up like oh wait maybe if I, I double track or like if i try and sing that same part but lower that that and you come up with so many cool things just because yep. you limit it somehow but yeah um uh, uh, okay 
one last question from the chat. I got a good one. Uh, someone who, again, from recording in a in a not proper recording room, how do you eliminate transients on guitar as much as possible? We're kind of going back to the first question, I guess, uh, uh, in terms of how you record it. Uh, I mean, when I'm recording real amps, obviously, if I've got a ton of gain, don't need compression. I've got a oh, ton yeah. of gain. Yeah, yeah. All those transients are being folded up by those beautiful uh, tubes, by those mm. valves, and out comes a nice, that comes a great sound. If I've got a, a crunch sound, which is my preferred sound, I like crunch because then I can um, play softly and it's almost clean. And then I can dig in and it's distorted. I, I'm I'm a classic rock guy. You know, that's yeah. what I grew up listening to. You go back and listen to the best ACDC records like Highway to Hell and Back in Black, those two albums, you know, one with Bon Scott, one with Brian Johnson. The guitar tones are almost clean compared with what people do now. Yeah, it's just yeah. like this. It's not, you know, it's just like this little. And yet they still sound amazing. So there's no need with a crunchy tone or a really heavy rock tone to really do any kind of compression whatsoever. Now, my guess is, is they're probably asking about the DI'd guitar going into their interface and they're probably using a virtual instrument. That can so, be yeah. an issue. I think the only way to really control it is to make sure you're not printing too hot and you're, you, you know what I mean? And that you're allowing yourself to um have a little bit of movement on that on that you know let 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 it be a little dynamic don't print it too hot and the worst case scenario is well there's a couple of things i'd want to know a little bit about the guitar i personally wouldn't put a compressor pedal going into an amp sim i know people that do but i tend to find that all of that extra grit that i'm used to from the attack on those transients is, is, is inherent it's what i want so i don't really want to compress going into it um but if you did want to try that, you could try it, but you're going to have to use that after the fact because okay. the way to do it then would be to do a look ahead. You need a compressor to, because whatever you use, unless it's got a look ahead function, which immediately would add latency anyway, but, but even if it does have a look ahead of function, it, you're, sorry, you'll need a look ahead to be able to control the transient because mm. the slowest setting on a traditional um, compressor is still going to let the transient through. It doesn't matter how fast you make it. You're still going to get pop, 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 that initial thing. Yeah. Um, so I'm not a big fan of doing that, but I do know people that put compressors on their DIs before they go into their, mm. into their amp sims. Um, but I would wonder what that problem could be. Um, is it in the performance? Is it, are you hearing? I don't know. Do we have any more info on that? You know, it could be the, the, the string hitting the pickups. You know what I mean? Sometimes... That gives you like these click, click these huge spikes. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah I do. Um, I'm trying to find a comment again. Uh, all right, got it. Nothing back from him since. We'll wait, see if we got any uh, any clarification on that. In the meantime, there's another very uh, popular question uh, regarding uh, using 96 kilohertz compared to 48. Uh, 48 kilohertz yeah i saw that as well it was an interesting one they said in pop um yeah. yeah it's an interesting question i mean you know scientifically there's so much discussion on this and um who put out the video on this recently one of the plug-in manufacturers um you know put out a video on this um the reality is is like that. yeah there's there's so many people talking about it mm. and then and then there's some scientific stuff. There's opinionated, opinionated stuff like that. But then there's some scientific stuff yeah. where they had somebody recording at, you know, 44, 48, 88, 2, 96, 190, all the different things. And, you know, they, they were measuring it and saying there's not much of a perceptible difference, you know, between the lowest and the highest rates. You know, yeah. once you got to 44, 1, they were saying, you know, the rest of it's really, you know, pretty, pretty crazy. Um you know, the differences are so negligible. However, I think However. that there is the, re the only reason or the main reason, how about that? Ma the main reason to do this is based on being future proofed. Um, you've got the downsides are your CPU usage goes nuts because if yeah. you wanted to record a 96K, suddenly it's twice as much, you know, um, 
CPU usage. You know, it doubles the amount. All your plugins now are doing twice as much work. Maybe you'll get some additional latency. Maybe sessions will run slower. Maybe, unfortunately, you're not able to as open as many plugins as you used to be able to do. Right. All of those are concerns. But the reason for doing it is really just this. Film and TV is about, I don't know, five years to 10 years ahead of us. They, they were at 48K you know, 20 plus years ago, 25 years ago, they, they've been asking for 96 K from audio professionals now for a long fricking time. So if you want to future proof yourself and always have your stuff recorded at the highest sample rate possible, Mm. then that's the smart thing to do. It's they're going to ask for your files to be that. And everybody says to me, well, I can just up sample. It's like, yeah, you can, Mm. you could. And then they come to you and say, we need all of the stems recreated at yeah. that as well. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons. So it's a catch-22. It comes back to that same question we were talking about with, um, you know, computers being the latest and greatest yeah, and all of that kind of stuff. It's like, uh, you know, USB versus Thunderbolt. And you went, uh, do what you can. In the back of your mind, try to do the best quality you can, but don't kick yourself and don't feel less than just because you don't have the latest and greatest and whatever just give yourself a break and realize you know i use this analogy all the time when revolver was being recorded which is you know depending on the top 10 top 100 list is either the number one or number two you know greatest album of all time you know all Mm -hmm. the critics love revolver and pet sounds and both great records tons of other records there but so you know when that was being recorded jeff emmerich was 19 turning 20 so i don't care what we want to say but the reality is and the guys in the band were you know 1965 66 early to mid 20s you know so this idea that music is only made by you know 65 year old professionals and you know on millions of dollars of equipment is just absolute yeah. crap Absolutely. you know you know jeff emmerich had his you know had the 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 freaking like the d19 the the equivalent of the hundred dollar microphone the hundred euro microphone he had some really nice gear don't get me wrong it was done on tape yes they were an amazing band all of those things are true we all love the beatles but we still can't ignore the fact that it's the creativity that makes that the greatest record of all time not you know usb3 not freaking, you know, 96K, not yes. any of that stuff. Yes. That's, the, that's the positive message from that. I, I hear so many people use greatness as a way to put others down. They, they, take, they go, oh, well, you know, that's because, you know, John Bonham was a genius. Yeah, John Bonham was one of the greatest drummers that ever lived, influenced so many people. Indeed. But that doesn't mean that if you're not 19 years old out there, that you can't be great as well. And, and just because John Bonham recorded with three mics on a few albums on tape and you've got your, you know, hundred dollar interface and, and a Samsung, what they call it, not the Samsung, sorry, the Samsung mic pack or the Shure mic pack. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Inexpensive things. Doesn't make you any less than, you know? And I think that that's, that's something I really, really, one of the reasons why I started doing this on the channel, because I heard a lot of the, you know, you go on the forums and there's so many of these experts and yeah, yeah, yeah. And they forget that this was made by kids, yeah. people in their teens and early twenties. The engineers were sometimes one year older, or even in some cases younger than the band. <laughs> Jack Douglas told me when he was working with Aerosmith, he got those first, some of those first big gigs, gigs in New York from Bob Ezrin, who was like the senior producer. Bob Ezrin's two years younger than Jack. Jack was 26 <laughs> producing <laughs> huge records that sold millions of copies and the yeah. senior producer was younger than him <laughs> i think when bob ezrin did the wall he may have been early 30s maybe i oh, mean for god insane. you know so we've got to remember that just People. be creative great performances exactly. don't you know just don't worry about age it doesn't matter if you're eight or 80 it's irrelevant don't worry about the gear whether you've got a million dollars worth of gear or a hundred dollars worth of gear doesn't matter completely irrelevant all of that stuff is just absolutely meaningless you know great right. songs and great performances you know with that mic you're using or i'm using i'm using an sm7 whatever it is whatever you got that's the most <laughs> important thing man all right it, it doesn't get any better than this i guess uh back on the human uh, make music keep making music whatever you've got and i yep. guess that's the that's the lesson here all right well warren thank you very very much for your time that was a brilliant chat uh thank you I'm that was looking that, forward that was a to the next fast one hour. yeah yeah absolutely i just like just got a 
a reminder. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you guys for tuning in. There were some really, really cool questions in there. I really hope you, uh, you enjoyed the live and you'll keep watching it and keep talking about it and discussing the 96 kilohertz and 48 kilohertz and, uh, and all of that in the comment section. I will say, Warren, thank you again. And uh, yeah, just keep, keep music, Thanks, Guillaume. Thanks, Guillaume. I really appreciate it.